Previously on Coffee with Kenobi. The staying at the resort also means you're a part of the story too, and it yeah. includes wardrobe. Is that right? Wow. Yeah, uh, that too. that's. So I don't know what that means. Oh, I, interesting. I'm going to stay in the stormtrooper suite. Here's your armor, Mister Zare. I <laughs> Just polish it up for you. Yeah, that would be cool, right? This is James Arnold Taylor, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Hmm, I have a good feeling about this. Hello and welcome to Coffee with Kenobi. I'm your host, Dan Z, enjoying a fresh cup of coffee in my Disney at at coffee mug from Disneyland, which I got last year when we flew to Hollywood. Welcome to our new listeners, and hello again to each and every member of our Coffee with Kenobi family. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing a cup of coffee with me each and every week. Joining me today is the co-host of Legends Library, Luke Siders. Hey, how you guys doing? Doing great. Thanks for being back on the show. This is uh, the first time you've been on since we reviewed Rogue One, so it's great to have you back. Yeah, yep. Yeah, uh, right now we're in the middle of the new Jedi Order series, which is long. So um, there's been some great books in there, and it's all new to me. So we're we're knee deep in that, coming up on the end. Yeah, it's actually so, I really enjoyed. It's a little that. better than the I Jedi. <laughs> Yeah, Corey and I joined you for IJ, and that was that was a lot of fun. Yeah, you guys do a fantastic job. And speaking of fantastic jobs, also joining me today is the co-host of the Cantina Cast, Joe Stinson. Hello there. There he is. Hey, Joe. And good to have you back on. Just, and I don't just do that because I'm on Coffee with Kenobi. I actually pretty much do that every episode that I intro on the Cantina Cast. That's for true. the most part, I I do it. So it's my it's kind of my calling card, and you know. Sometimes people get excited when I do it, Dan. Why weren't you more excited when I do it? I, I'm working see, on look my, on my face. Guinness, actually. Well, that well, that's my. Uh, it's actually that's my Ewan, and I've always done the Ewan version of it. But I've been privately working on an Alec Guinness one, so I might have to bust that out one day. I look forward to that. Yeah, and the Cantina Cast and, and Coffee with Kenobi have been working side by side uh, for a, for a very long time. In fact. It's I been a while, though. It's been it's been a while. I think it's been since September of 2015 since oh, really? we ever got the talk. I don't. Yeah, I don't think we've ever even had a discussion, even on the Force Awakens, like about if we even wow. if you liked it or I liked it. I don't think we've ever really ever talked about it, at least in an in depth way. Can I ask that question just to start the show? Did you like the Force Awakens? I did. I Let absolutely loved it. One. In fact, I've come okay. to think of it as a perfect Star Wars film. Yeah, well, you know what my first word was in the our initial reaction show? It was masterpiece. Yeah. And then my, and Mike gives me crap for that all the time, uh, you know, because he said, oh, you just think it's a masterpiece. Well, maybe it is. So anyway, <laughs> I'm sorry. No worries. Well, yeah, well, it's happy to have you on again. And later in the show, CWK newsman Tom Gross will join us, as well as Disney insider Jim Hill is returning to give insights on Galaxy's Edge and the future of the Star Wars Hotel. And then in the coffee chat, Mediocre Jedi is going to share an interview from San Diego Comic-Con that he did with Hasbro. Let's start the show. I was going to do a little bit of a thing on, on Porg talk, but I think we've there's been plenty of talk about Porgs online, and this, these new cute little critters have certainly taken the Star Wars universe by storm, but I'm sure we'll get to that much later. Something... Um, more immediate has come up, and that is we have a composer of the untitled Han Solo film. It is John Powell, who's best known for the Bourne Identity films, Shrek, both Kung Fu Panda 1 and 2, and How to Train Your Dragon 1 and 2. So he will be the third composer, with John Williams, of course, and Michael Giacchino, to be a part of the Star Wars universe musically. What do you guys think about this? I, I personally don't know much about him i can't think uh i mean you name the movies there uh it doesn't ring i mean obviously i've seen the jason Bourne movies and things like that but uh it's been so long the music doesn't really ring a bell my thing is is if you know you know you've got the pick of the litter here if you're lucasfilm if you're disney on these talented 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 musicians and there are so many talented artists and musicians out there that, that really you know it, it would be hard to go wrong. And I know maybe some people say, well, Hey, maybe they got something else wrong, but you know, we won't get into that, but, uh, but they've corrected that hopefully. And hopefully they won't have to correct this. I think it's, uh, I, I have faith in it just because, and, and I love the music of star Wars. And as long as you kind of keep with that, 
you know, Star Wars has a certain sound. It's got that John Williams sound to it. So as long as you're in the ballpark, but be creative, do your own thing. I, I, I think you'll be fine. Just some of those movies you mentioned, I'm trying to picture the soundtrack for them. Um, so I might have to go back and listen to those. It, it's hard to tear away from John Williams. I know we won't always get him. Right. Um, and I liked the Rogue One soundtrack. But there was it. some yeah. time, there was some points in the movie though where I was like, man, I really wish you know a John Williams track would have won at this point. Um, but that's just me being picky. So you know, I'm sure you'll do a great job, and it, you know, it's great to try stuff new as well. So. Yeah, he, I'm excited for it. Hey, come on, Han Solo movie. Right. You don't even need a soundtrack. Exactly. This, it, people saying Yahoo all the time would be cool. It's it's going to be interesting because he uh, he has already come out and said that he's uh, it's going to score it in the style of the original Star Wars movies, but retain his own distinct voice, which I think was the same thing that happened with Giacchino and Rogue One, which I think is a better soundtrack than The Force Awakens, and that's not to detract from The Force Awakens soundtrack as much as I thought the Rogue One soundtrack could have easily been outtakes from the original score or the original film. That's how beautifully I thought it synced up. In fact, I find myself listening to that soundtrack more than any other soundtrack, and I think that's because it's probably the newest. I mean, it's not probably. It is the newest, so that may be why that is happening, but... I see nothing but positives here. I, and I expect that with all of these standalone films, you're going to see a kind of a, a new composer for each one. And, and as you said, Joa, Disney has their pick of the litter. And everybody who is in Hollywood, this is going to be a dream of theirs conceivably to work on a Star Wars film. So we're, the fact that we're going to get so much variety, I think, is a beautiful thing. Yeah, and it doesn't seem as, and I don't want to, I don't want to knock the music side of it, but it's, it just doesn't take as long to do the music side of it as it is being on set and directing the movie and getting somebody to say, Hey, I'm going to give two years of my life away. Because if you look at uh, somebody like Ryan Johnson, who's doing the last Jedi, I mean, he not only has to write the script and that takes how long, and then he's got to direct the movie and then he's got to do, uh, you know, post-production. And then he's got to, promote the movie for, I mean, he's literally taking two years out of his life where he's like, I can't do another project. And with a, a musician like this, it's obviously, it just doesn't take quite as long. I believe, uh, I believe that they did the original, uh, uh star Wars soundtrack back in 76 or whenever it was. And they recorded it in like two or three days. Like it was like, it was very fast from what you can, you know, think now, that doesn't have anything to say how long it took him to write the music. I don't know that, but to actually get the London Symphony Orchestra together, uh, you know, they pretty much got it wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, and out the door, and they got it done. So to actually make the music and do all of those things, uh, not quite as long. So you're not asking somebody to take uh, a big, huge chunk out of their life. So, yeah, you do have more options uh, when, when you're talking about that side of it, I think. Yes, there's, there's, it's nice to get some news, some more news on the film, and I'm hoping we'll hear something about a title in the foreseeable future. But in the meantime, we're going to take a break, and up next, Jim Hill will be bringing us behind the scenes of Galaxy's Edge. This is Coffee with Kenobi. Better than one of those coffee chains, it's Coffee with Kenobi. Coffee with Kenobi is sponsored by Penguin Random House Audio. Looking to catch up on the latest Star Wars books? Try listening to them on audio. Featuring sound effects and music directly from the movies, Star Wars audiobooks are the definitive listening experience. From brand new audiobooks such as Thrawn and Empire's End Aftermath to our blockbuster movie tie-in editions, you'll have plenty to keep you entertained. Visit penguinrandomhouseaudio.com slash Star Wars for sample clips and to start listening now. Coffee with Kenobi is also sponsored by the Star Wars Digital Card Trader Collecting App from Tops. If you love Star Wars and love the excitement of chasing your favorite Star Wars collectibles, the Star Wars Digital Card Trader Collecting App from Tops is for you. Download the free app from iTunes or Google Play and collect your favorite images from the classic 1977 Star Wars cards to the Clone Wars, Star Wars Rebels, The Force Awakens, Rogue One, and much more. Collect and trade with friends new and old through the Star Wars Digital Card Trader Collecting App from Tops. 
These are the cards you're looking for. You know how much of an impact Patreon has on Coffee with Kenobi. It really makes a big difference in uh, the show and what we're able to do. And I'm talking about CWK family Patreon contributors like Tyler Wiggins, Jason Hall, Dennis Keithley, Angela Souse, Aaron Harris, David Strutt, Jim Capron, Connie Shee, Mediocre Jedi, BJ Smith, Nick Deco, Adam Leonard, Mark Suter, Mike Audette, Eric Struthers, Jared Cantor, and Suara Sala. Patreon is there to help CWK with show expenses. We have our RSS feed, which is how we're able to distribute the show to so many different podcasting places like iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, what have you. Uh, It costs money to host the webpage every month, microphone upkeep, travel, including airlines, hotel, food transportation. There's a lot that goes into making coffee with Kenobi what it is, and we can't do it without Patreon contributors. And I think uh, most of it is stuff that you'll see. Some of it is just stuff I added recently. For five bucks, um, you get a mention at the start of the show, which is what I just did. And then we also follow you on Twitter. Uh, $10 for a month, you get the Google Hangout access, where once a month we will just get online and have a, a video conversation about whatever you want to talk about. $35 is a coffee mug. For 50 you can get a CWK mug or a T-shirt. Uh, $100 and more, you get the mug and the T-shirt. And both 50 100 and up, depending on how many months you contribute, you are able to co-host one show, two shows, or an entire month of shows at Coffee with Kenobi. And that's pretty cool. So far, the response has been really great. Jim Hill joins us. Jim, thank you for having a cup of coffee with us again. Well, I, you know, it, it, it's it's nice to be back so quickly, but to be honest, given all the uh, the expo, I can understand this getting back together. And, and seriously, you guys should have come. You know, I know. I, I, I know I was nagging you the last show, but uh, honestly, you should have come. Obviously, huge, gigantic news. A lot of things confirmed. Mm-hmm. Some things you had said when you were on our show. So now we have a name for Star Wars Land, and tell us uh, kind of how that went. Well, you know, actually, there's kind of a funny story to that. The news broke a day ahead of time um, about the name. I, I don't know if you guys heard this, that somebody on Reddit actually dug down into the HTML of the the original press release, and they're buried in the code was, you know, the, the name to be released, Galaxy's Edge. And, and um, mind you, this had been bubbling up, you know, uh, you know uh, for a couple of months now. That was one of several names. And I guess um, Disney was kind of concerned about it because obviously there is, you know, the the Edge phone, you know, the Galaxy, but, you know... Um, you know, I, I guess legal signed off on the idea, and it does, you know, it does play nicely into the whole backstory that Disney and Lucasfilm have crafted for this thing. That it, you know, it is at the, you know, this 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 you know port that's kind of fallen off of the, you know, the the, the char starts because of you know now everybody uses you know jump you know to light speed and. This was, you know, a formula popularly trade space, you know, at the edge of what they're calling wild space. Uh, but, you know, it, it dates back to the sublight days. And now that everybody's doing light speed, it's now become a favorite for smugglers who, frankly, you know, want to be operating out of the shadows, which perhaps explains why the Millennium Falcon ended up there. So, And like you, like when you were on before and we talked about the immersive qualities about galaxy's edge and especially the star wars hotel which we'll talk about really soon um did the, and when you see, you know about this and then you see the model you realize that this is definitely something special that we haven't really quite seen from disney to this degree and that's saying something considering avatar no absolutely i mean and what's truly truly great about this is honestly depending on which way you come in now, now it's important to stress here that the disneyland uh version of Ga- <coughs> galaxy's edge <coughs> i'm sorry disneyland version of galaxy's edge has three entrances you can enter through the critter countryside 
you can come off of uh, Big Thunder Trail in Frontierland, and you can enter at basically at the top of the trail from Fantasyland. But each of these points starts off the story in a different way. I mean, you know, for example, if you come up through Critter Country, you come through this thick forest, and you, you suddenly come around a bend, and here's an X-Wing, here's an A-Wing, and, you know, here's a, a, a group of resistance fighters who immediately try to recruit you for a mission that, you know, we, you know, we've landed at the edge of, you know, galaxy's edge here. And, you know, we're, you know, we know the first order is checking this place out and we need your help. And conversely, if you come in through the fantasy land side, um, you arrive to this very nervous marketplace because a first order tie fighter has just landed. And in fact, um, What's really cool about this area, I, I got, um, you know, one of the Imagineers to sort of walk me through. There's actually going to be, this is, you know, where Kylo Ren will be making his entrance multiple times a day for, you know, I, I don't know if meet and greet is the proper term, but there's actually going to be the equivalent of a stunt show that happens in this square that, um, you know, the, the stormtroopers are here, are going to meet some resistance and there's going to be some fighting and chasing around the rooftops and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, a, a really exciting, interesting place to to enter into the uh, Star Wars uh, theme park story from. And then for those of you who want to have your own adventure, if you take the the entrance off of Big Thunder Trail, this this basically puts you in the heart of the city and you're kind of in a, a, a story neutral point. I mean, you'll hear from, you know, the various shopkeepers and, you know, those sorts of folks who walk into the streets that, yeah, we, we've heard that a TIE fighter just landed you know, a couple of blocks over and we've heard that, you know, there's something going on with the resistance outside of town, but it's, you know, you get, it's up to you to decide which way you go. And of course, if you happen to walk just straight to the back, um, this is, you know, the, the starport where the Millennium Falcon is parked. Um, you know, I, again, I just, I, I love, you know, the notion that three different ways into the same land and three different stories. I think that's amazing. And I'm also hearing, besides, I heard about the multiple entrances, but not to that degree. And the stunt show sounds very cool. But I'm mm -hmm. wondering why Disneyland is going to be able to open first. And uh, what are you hearing about entrances uh, in Hollywood Studios? Well, okay. Uh, to answer your second question first, there are only two entrances. Uh, one will come off of um, what they're actually they announced just today. They're calling Grand Avenue. Um, it's the uh, used to be Streets of America. Um, oh, sure. The the last remains of it that'll feed you into uh, the forest section of. Um, uh, get the uh, galaxy's edge for Disney Hollywood studios. Uh, the other entrance that will come in off of toy story land, which is kind of be hmm. kind of an interesting tonal change, but that puts you right into the, the tie fighter town square nervous merchant area. Um, now uh, the other band on this, I know we talked a little bit about, uh, on the last show about, you know, the great movie ride closing, uh, which, by the way, is, is you know, about to happen. You know, that, that they're going to be shutting that down to make way for the new Mickey's Runaway Way Ride uh, attraction. But, uh, again, this is a 95,000 square foot building, and they're not going to need all of that room for this new Mickey attraction. So... This is where I think we talked a little bit about the third street, the third area that's going to be built. Yes. Um, that's another that's another reason why there isn't uh, a separate entrance coming into this part of the park. Um, you know that this is going to be strictly for the uh, Walt Disney World Resort, and again gives those folks who are staying in the Star Wars themed hotel, uh, which is going to be built near the uh, um the world drive the old world drive entrance of disney hollywood studios that's being discontinued um and this will give those folks uh a, a new area to play in and uh because again those you know the folks who are going to be staying in that hotel it's it's 
uh, much more specific, longer missions, more interaction with with merchants and smugglers, and you know that sort of thing. Um, but but again, we're we're a couple of years out from that. You know, first things first is. You know, and again, that's one of the reasons why um, Hollywood is is running one behind schedule because this will be the first place that the Star Wars hotel, um, you know, gets built. And and Bob Chapek was pretty straightforward about this that they were so thrilled with the result, you know, the results that the survey got that. Um, he was kind of making no bones about the, you know, he, they think this is going to be a huge thing for the entire company. So I wouldn't necessarily count on there being only one Star Wars hotel. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Um, I, I think they've identified this, uh, as a franchise and I, to be honest, I think you'll probably see Florida, probably Japan, and then the question is, how do you do this in California? And uh, I have to wonder, given that that you know Disney did have plans. In fact, they, they're supposedly moving forward uh, with a you know a four star hotel that's supposed to be built in what uh, used to be the temporary parking. Uh, well, still is, but it will be going away when they begin construction of the facility. But uh, the temporary parking at Downtown Disney in Anaheim. Hmm. And it, it was supposed to feature this, you know, amazing restaurant on the roof that looked down into the parks and would allow you to see the new Star Wars land as well as the fireworks over the castle. And you have to wonder, given the ridiculously strong results for that survey, um, whether Disney is maybe revisiting that idea that, you know, this is a piece of property that is – ridiculously close to um where star wars land is going to go in and you know maybe thinking long term um i mean you know that uh, part of the problem is disney wants to have a four-star hotel on property there's a lot of people who come to walt disney or uh, disneyland in anaheim and and want that you know when they're they're when their show is presenting at the Anaheim Convention Center, or, or they're you know they're, they're presenting in the convention center that that's at the Grand Californian, so you know this is a market segment that could be served by that. But I'm, I'm just told that the results for that survey were so ridiculously strong that people wanted to do that, have that Star Wars experience today. Um, that and it's just this whole notion of well maybe we should find another place for the. The four star hotel. Well, um, well two, so. two things on that. One, uh, mm -hmm. since I don't have a, the map in front of me and being so familiar with the parks, I used to work at Hollywood Studios. Where, mm -hmm. um, how close would the hotel be to the park uh, in relation to something like uh, the yacht and beach club in proximity to Epcot or the studios? And this is actually going to be on the far side of that. I mean, you remember, you know, when you were driving at a Disney property off of World Drive. Sure. You're coming up World Drive, you're headed to the kingdom, and you have to take that, that ramp to the right mm -hmm. uh, that takes you to the film strip entrance to yes. – um, Okay. Okay. You go, you go through the film strip, and immediately to your right, uh, there used to be this giant chunk of wetlands to your left – uh, you'd see um, Streets of America, Muppet Vision, and then you'd come up to the, okay. uh, you know, okay. So we're talking about the hotel with its parking lot and all that being built on the wetlands. So you could okay. conceivably walk to the entrance of the park, or is it still gonna, probably going to be some sort of a shuttle or a bus? Well, if you're staying in the Star Wars hotel, the plan is that there's going to be the equivalent of an elevated walkway that will take you oh, wow. straight into the park. Um, you know, there's been some discussion of, you know, should there be a Star Wars themed transportation system? You know, something that gives you that sort of dramatic feel, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, that the, there's been some push back and forth because 
obviously people are going to want to visit the Star Wars Hotel who aren't necessarily staying at the Star Wars, Wars Hotel. And a lot of the way Disney's designing this experience is sort of modeled after the Disney Cruise Line. Uh, you know, with the whole notion of, you know, in fact, you know, for example, you can book a two day package, a three day package, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the various experiences, whether it's meeting with smugglers or, you know, getting parts for your droid or, or however, you know, you spend your time. Um, but you, you can always return to your hotel room, which has, you know, this amazing, uh, you know, faux window, uh, you know, sort of kind of like the magical windows that are on the cruise line for the rooms sure. that don't have the view. Um, but this will be, you know, supposedly you're in, you know, a vessel that's orbiting over the planet where Galaxy's Edge is located. Wow. So, and yeah. um, I'm almost afraid to ask this one, but uh, immediately after the news on Twitter, Len Testa posted some numbers he was hearing as far as how much it may cost to stay at the hotel yeah um. I, I, and if, <laughs> I i know that sounds pricey i mean again you know but remember it's sick if you're going with the cruise line model all right and it's 650 dollars you know for a two-night package per you know and then with each additional person who comes into the room being an additional 200 dollars um, I, and I think it's four people in a room that maxes out. I mean, it does sound pricey, but if you, you factor in, this is a, you know, two day, you know, two night stay, um, supposedly two, two night, uh, and, and, you know, the equivalent of, uh, two and a half days worth of entertainment between, you know, what you get after you check in at say three o'clock. And, you know, they, they, you know, what you'll get, you know, on your third day when you have to clear another room by 11 o'clock. Um, this is going to be, you know, a pretty hefty Star Wars experience. Everybody, you know, when they enter the room, gets a swag bag. Um, I, you know, I, I, there's been some discussion of what's in the swag bag. You know, because obviously you need credits, you need, you know, stuff that will help you negotiate your way around Galaxy's Edge and that sort of thing. And and again, the various scenarios that will play out. Um, again, if if you compare the price point to what they do on the Disney Cruise Line, it, it really is, a, you know, comparable entertainment experience. And... You know, I, and and more to the point, the one of the reasons Disney set this price point is they asked the folks who filled out the survey what would they pay, you know, to, oh. to do this, and it, it with understanding that it was it is an exclusive experience within Galaxy's Edge that you, you know you, you'll. St go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. no go ahead. I say, are you are you expecting, or is Disney expecting any kind of a pushback on this because? Obviously, a lot of people are want, are going to want to experience this, and we're maybe hoping for a moderate resort, and obviously we weren't going to go all-star when it comes to Star Wars, but do you expect any kind of complaints about that? No, I, 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 I'm so sorry. I, I really don't. I mean, part of, part of the issue here is that at least initially, this is going to be a boat, boutique hotel. You know, remember, we, we, we talked about you know, the first building, um, initially, I, I want to say it's, what is it, 400-room hotel with two wing, you know, two expansion pads for wings of 300 each. So at full build-out, it's only 1,000 rooms. Um, and one, honestly, one of the reasons that Disney is going to have to um, you know, or feels like they're justified with this price point is there's, this is pretty labor intensive. There's going to be a lot of people behind the scenes, uh, you know, moving things around, you know, whether it's, it's, uh, you know, making sure that scenarios play out the way they, they're supposed to setting up props, um, you know, that, that, you know, meeting with you at the hotel. I mean, there's going to be a whole cast of characters that just, you know, or on the spaceship that is supposedly, you know, fl you know, floating over Galaxy's Edge that, sure. you know, you only encounter in the hotel. And more to the point, you know, <laughs> they're there to interact with you. 
So um, we're yeah, talking not much, much more immersive than anything, not only in Disney but or theme parks, but just worldwide. I mean, this is a very, very unique experience. And don't get me wrong, I, I've already spoken to my wife about this. I've already started a fund, so I'm definitely going mm-hmm. to stay. Just a question okay. of when. No, and and you know, I, I, I look, you know, it, it it upsets me that. We kind of live in this world now that, you know, that, that, you know, there are kids who go to Walt Disney World or Disneyland and, um, you know, find that, you know, they're kind of on the outside looking in. And it wasn't all that long ago that, you know, whether you were, you know, a president or a popper, if you could get into Disneyland or, or one of the theme parks, they, everybody had basically the same experience. And now we're in kind of a skybox world where it's yes. like, yeah, everybody can go to the game, but not everybody can have seats in the floor or not everybody can gonna be looking down from above from the skybox. So um but this that's the reality. You know, right. that Disney is looking to cater to that audience with deeper pockets and who are willing to pay for, you know, this sort of experience. I mean, you know, just the D23 Expo that just happened. There are folks they they, they call them the sorcerers and they, I want to say they pay two thousand or twenty five hundred dollars a piece mm-hmm. for their tickets to D twenty three Expo, but it guarantees them seats at every single presentation. It guarantees them early access access to all the shopping opportunities. I mean, you know, they they pay top dollar for that sort of access and, and celebration has you know things like that as well too. I I think it's uh, like you said, the surveys must have been incredible. Mm-hmm. As far as the reactions to that kind of a thing, and it's, I mean, I also can't wait to see merchandise, and obviously it's going to be a while before we get to see things of that nature, but if you can't stay there, you can still visit, you can still enjoy the resort, much like any resort on property, it sounds like. Well, or maybe not. Let, <laughs> you know, remember, I mean, you know, one in, of the conceits yeah. of, of this resort is that you know, I mean, you 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 board a conveyance that takes you up to the, you know, the um, the vessel that's orbiting, and uh, you know, um, again, again, I, I hate to say that you know that you know they they turned the riffraff away, but you know, <laughs> I, you know, it, it's one of these situations where again, if the model is the cruise line. It's not like you can get in a rowboat and go out to the cruise, you know, you know to the, the, the magic that, mm-hmm. um, yeah, you know, if sense. you if you have friends staying there or, you know, I mean. The cruise I, analogy I don't is, is a really perfect comparison because the cruise, uh, you obviously sleep there, but that's pretty much the bare. Uh, that's mm-hmm. not even the, on the radar because you've got the shows, you've got the incredible dining, you've got the yeah. experiences and. This is going to be. This isn't a hotel. This isn't a resort. This is an actual experience. It's like Star Wars camp. No, I like. You know, oh, sorry. I like to yeah. think too that if I'm paying this much, it's going to be you know a more personal experience. So you know, not as many people are going to be around, and I'll actually get to experience things sure. more at a personal level for your story that I guess is being told. You know, so that's it. That's it exactly. You know that that and and. You know, and let me be blunt here. Disney wants the people who go on this, who have this experience, who pay for this, to evangelize, to go back and tell their friends who are Star Wars fans, like, "Oh my God, you know, you've never experienced anything like this." And you know, I did, you know, and and with the thought that you know they're not really going to have to advertise all that much. No. You know, they'll. The, you know, they'll be press early on and people will enjoy it. And then, you know, um, you know, the company will just pivot and build the, you know, Star Wars hotel for the Tokyo Disney Resort and then try to figure out where exactly the Star Wars hotel gets built in Anaheim. Um, They're this, probably ready again, ch- designs for the coffee with Kenobi wing right now, I'm sure. Well, there we go, you know, but. <laughs> But again, seriously, you know that, that Bob Chapek, out of all the stuff he announced, he seems so excited about this because again, it, 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 the Disney company had accidentally tripped over a new revenue stream, 
And, you know, and the, the response was so strong and so positive that, you know, normally with a survey like this, that, you know, Disney pricks, takes the results internally and, you know, choose on it for a month, if not, you know, a year or two. And remember, this survey only came out like two and three months ago. And here, bang. Hey, you know, you know, we yes, we did the survey and yes, we're excited about this year and idea. And yes, we think this could be a huge thing for the company. The, so, uh, um, there, there's so much money. It, it's too bad that your coffee's running low because I could, I could sit and listen to you talk about this for hours. I really appreciate you coming back on the show. Where can listeners get in touch with you if they want to ask you a question or just say hello? Well, let's see. I do the unofficial guide Disney dish podcast with Len Testa. Uh, I have my own website, jimhillmedia.com, which really doesn't sound all that humble. Uh, and I do also some stories for the Huffington Post. So I, I'm, you know, just Google Jim Hill. I'll pop up somewhere. So, And we um, will definitely have links, of course, to all of these things in the show notes. I'm happy to have you uh, back for a cup of coffee anytime that you would like, sir. Oh, happy to drop in. And and again, given what Disney's building and all the other stuff that's going to be announced, I would imagine we'll have a lot to chat about. I would think so. Very good. Jim Hill, ladies and gentlemen. After the break, Tom has news. This is Coffee with Kenobi. This is Coffee with Kenobi. Oh, pass the cream, Jim. Looking to catch up on the latest Star Wars books? Try listening to them on audio. Featuring sound effects, top-notch narrators, and music directly from the movies, Star Wars audiobooks are the definitive listening experience. From Han Solo to C-3PO to Admiral Akbar, you'll recognize all of your favorite characters. Listen to movie tie-ins like Rogue One and The Force Awakens, to book titles such as Thrawn and Empire's End Aftermath, to classic audiobooks like William Shakespeare's Star Wars. With Star Wars audiobooks, you'll have plenty of Star Wars listening to keep you entertained. Visit penguinrandomhouseaudio.com forward slash Star Wars for sample clips and to start listening now. The Star Wars Digital Card Trader collecting app features incredible images from many aspects of the saga, including the original trilogy, the prequels, the Clone Wars, Rebels, The Force Awakens, and Rogue One. It's the quality you have come to expect from Tops. It's also easy to get into and really fun, too. Your favorite Star Wars characters, scenes, and moments are in every pack. To get started, download the app for free from iTunes or Google Play, and then be sure to open the app each day for free credits to spend on card packs from the cantina. Plus, if you can't get what you're looking for, there's a place to trade with your friends as you complete your Star Wars collection. And if you're an experienced collector, there are exclusive cards, special inserts, and autograph opportunities for you to enjoy. Don't worry about missing the cards and sets you want either, as you can sign up for notifications right on the app. The Star Wars Digital Card Trader collecting app from Tops can be downloaded for free from iTunes or Google Play. Be sure to download the app and start your collection today. The Star Wars Digital Card Trader collecting app from Tops is available now. And remember, these are the cards you're looking for. are back and Tom Gross of course joins us with the news this is it's getting easier and easier to come up with stories isn't it oh man I'll tell you what there's a there's there's just a little bit going on these days we almost have to arm wrestle with what we're going to cover and where where we're going to cover it in the show I know it's kind of I just shuffle the deck and I pull three and we go (laughs) let's go let's do this Let's do it. Good day, everybody. And uh, Marvel Comics Star Wars main title is set for a change. According to StarWars.com, the creative writer artist team of Kieran Gillen and Salvador LaRocca will take the helm of Star Wars with issue 38 this November. Readers of Marvel Star Wars comics will know this team from the Darth Vader series. And currently, Gillen is working on the Doct- Dr. Afra series. Gillen says they want to do for Luke, Leia, and Han – what they did with the character Darth Vader. They begin by taking our heroes to the po- post-apocalyptic planet, 
of Jetta. The cover art for that issue can be seen on StarWars.com, showing Luke cloaked in robes and a dusty terrain with his blue lightsaber ignited, and above him, in the distance, a Star Destroyer with a squad of TIE fighters heading to the surface. Editor Jordan White calls Gillen one of the best writers in the business today, and with his writing on Darth Vader and Dr. Aphra, he has a great grasp on heroes and villains of the Star Wars galaxy. He does, and uh, I interviewed Kieran Yellen for StarWars.com, and we talked on Skype like this, uh, and the guy is hilarious, and he's brilliant, and when I saw that there was a change, at first I was a little nervous because um, Jason Aaron's been doing it since the beginning, and honestly, I don't know if you two read the comics, but uh, I have found that the last few issues besides the Screaming Citadel, I've found them to become a little more stale. So knowing that he's coming on, and if he does for these characters what he did for Vader, I mean, he adds some interesting depth to characters that are, you know, f- over 40 years old. And it's really, really in good hands. Now, I'm not crazy about them going back to Jetta, but uh, I guess I will, not guess, I know I will reserve my judgment until I read it. What do you guys think? Well, I mean, I've always liked the idea of revisiting Jetta in uh, some form or fashion. I, I know we, me and Mike, have speculated on it before, and I know that's the dirty word over here. That's on right, uh, how to mute that? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you know, I mean, we we've always uh, liked that. I mean, ever since I saw it in Rogue One, I said this is a place that they could revisit. I don't know if it's going to be a place, uh, you know, this character goes or that character goes. So. Uh, it's definitely a place that interested me a whole lot, and I would definitely love to uh, see more of Jetta because I think that there's a lot of potential when you talk about the lore of the Jedi and where they, uh, you know, where they came from, and you've got all these different sects of uh, the f- Force, and it's not just the Jedi; it's all these different, uh, different kind of religions of the Force, if you will, uh, if that's the proper term I want to use here, but. Yeah, so I mean, Jetta, I, I abs- Jetta was my favorite thing in Rogue One. So if they revisit in the comics, it's something that would reinterest me in the comics, Dan, because uh, as you said, uh, the, sometimes your interest in the comics might wane here or there, or maybe it gets a little stale, I guess, to use your exact words. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah, uh, the, for me, specifically the, that, that, that series, the Star Wars series itself. Right. I, I, I go in and out with the comics, and I'm more out than in. But uh, if you give me something like that that I could sink my teeth into, and you're, and if it's something with the lore of the Force, uh, that's right up my alley. That's the kind of stuff I really like, and I think that's probably why it was my favorite part of Rogue One because there wasn't a whole lot of that, obviously, in Rogue One because it wasn't about Jedi. But you know, you had this place where, you know, the Jedi they were at one point for whatever reason. So yeah, I mean, Jedi, let's revisit it. I, I'm all for it. I think there's a lot of play, too, because they kind of introduced the planet and there's not a ton of background. So they do have some play with how they can, you know, develop the story in the future. So I think that gives the writers a lot of ability there, whether they stay there for the series or not. Um, But it could be a great place to start, especially with Rogue One, you know, still in everybody's mind. Well, and if he's researching more about trying to learn more about the Jedi, because this is before he encounters Yoda, it makes sense that he would end up on Jetta because of the Kyra crystals that they had. Tom, what about you? Yeah, how, have you how have you felt the Star Wars title has gone recently? Dan, you took the words right out of my mouth. Um, I, I I look forward to the Star Wars title every single month. I agree with you that it's sort of it's it, it, stale is a great word for it. Um, and if I can just say, you know, that great gets stale, it can. Um, and uh, but I, and and I'll say about the sleeping city or the. Um, Oh, it just escaped my mind. The Citadel uh, storyline, Screaming yeah. Citadel. Um, I, I must have missed something. Either I didn't get a comic in my hands or I didn't – I'd never experienced the conclusion to that. I don't know. It's in Afra, but, Dr. Afra. I, yeah. I, I, I need to go back and make sure I've – Dr. Afra number all eight, those. I believe. I think this is going to be I, – I loved the Vader – uh, comics. I love the writing in the Afra series. So I just I think if you can make great better this that's, that we're going to see that is just my opinion. And and I do I agree with everyone else uh, that uh, that 
I, I, I really am, am intrigued by the return to Jetta and all the possibilities from uh, just discoveries that they can make, um, whether it's Jedi or, or Rebel Origins or mm. something completely new. You know, I, I just I think that's really neat. And I think it's a great it's a really interesting prospect. And before we move on, it is worth mentioning that Salvador La Roca, he draws likenesses of these actors so beautifully that especially mm-hmm. in the screaming citadel when i was looking at luke and han i was looking at harrison ford and mark hamill i mean the guy is incredible and he he drew darth vader and made him expressive which is hard to do when he's got a, a helmet on and, you, and he doesn't make expression so i mean they could not be yeah. in these two are at the top of their game so so this is going to be cool Absolutely. Well, settle in. We got a lot on this next story. When Lucasfilm Publishing held a new Star Wars stories panel at the San Diego Comic-Con hosted by Michael Seglin, corrective creative director at Lucasfilm Publishing. It was an all-star cast of Star Wars authors, including Ben Blacker of Join the Resistance, Christian Blavelt of Star Wars Made Easy, Cullen Bunn was there with the Marvel Darth Vader miniseries, Christy Golden of the much-anticipated Star Wars. Wars, Battlefront 2, Inferno. Claudia Gray joined them with the upcoming Leia, Princess of Alderaan. Jarrett Krosowska of Star Wars Jedi Academy, The Force Over Sleeps. <laughs> Beth Rivas of Star Wars Rebel Rising and Kevin Scott and Landry Q. Walker of the upcoming Star Wars Adventures comic rounds out the panelists. They all talked about their book projects, which I, I always enjoy hearing about, and their first memories of experiencing Star Wars 40-some years ago. Well, they aren't all 40 years, but uh, but some of them are. Uh, some highlights include one of my favorites was a moment when Beth Revis was giving the summary of her Rebel Rising title, and Christy Golden interjected how much she enjoyed Revis's book, and then she surprises Revis by telling her that one of the characters in Rebel Rising shows up in Battlefront 2 Inferno Squad. Revis, in complete excited shock, with hand over her mouth, giggles and says, I did not know that. <laughs> It was a great, great moment. Christian Blavelt, the newest member of to the writing to Star Wars books, wrote his book Star Wars Made Easy for those fans who who have friends or family who may have never seen the saga or just don't get it. We we all have those friends, right? That's right. Um, Blavelt says he tried to write from the point of view of those who know nothing about what Star Wars is all about. Then Michael Seglane wraps up by revealing some book covers, including two issues of the IDW Star Wars Adventures and a future Luke and Leia story from IDW, as well as covers from the upcoming Marvel Comics Mace Windu Jedi of the Republic. And to the applause of the crowd, revealed the cover and announced that a Thrawn adaptation by Jody Hauser of Timothy Zahn's novels will be released next February. And finally, Seglane mentioned that a somewhat revealing story to the journey to the last Jedi about Canto Bite will be available on December 5th before the movie comes out. Hmm. Boy, there's lots in there. Yeah, there's a lot to dive into. We let's uh, go around the table here and let's talk about something that really stands out for you. Joe, let's start with you. Uh, yeah, I'm already talking to I'm not going to give any spoilers away, but the. Uh, People are already talking about the Inferno Squadron, and they're saying how much they really already enjoy that. I've got mm-hmm. uh, a couple of listeners of mine who've uh, talked about it, and, and and they're really enjoying that new perspective from the Empire. And one of those same listeners about that we talk about the Captain Phasma book, but I know it's I don't know if we're on the panel, but they're in there, and he kind of told me he said, you know, I'm really looking forward to that in one way, is if. They, he said, I'm going to wait till after The Last Jedi to read that book because I want them to do something in the movie first that makes me want to know about her character uh, because I don't want the book huh. to uh, to dictate uh, like that's her whole backstory is just the book and they just and it's a big cop out. So I had that, the same listener who told me about how much they're enjoying Inferno Squadron so far also told me that about Phasma. So uh, the, they're on the fence on both. So, I mean, and, and I completely understood where they were coming from on that. So um, that was my buddy Albert. So I got to give him a shout out for uh, uh, giving me kind of some of the inside because I haven't started the Inferno Squadron yet. But he's telling me how much he's he's mentioned it several times to me, how much he really is enjoying that book. So uh 
yeah, I mean, that's, those are the ones that stand out to me just because, uh, those are kind of the ones that have been in my frame of mind lately and people have been talking to me about them. Luke, what about you? Well, obviously Inferno Squad, um, I haven't had a chance to grab it yet on Audible. Uh, I got some credits built up, uh, trying to finish some of our new Jedi Order books first. But if anybody knows me, they know what I'm excited for, and that's Thrawn. I mean, I can't get enough of that character. To me, he's just such an exciting villain. He's totally different than any other villain. Um, it may not be another novel by Timothy Zahn, but I'm sure that he'll be done right. And Rebels did a great job of portraying him. I thought the you know, it was true to his old self. So I'm excited for that. Hmm. Interesting that you, that you mentioned that because that's actually the thing I'm, uh, the least excited about. And there's only one reason. Ah. Now I, I love the Thrawn book. And although I definitely want to talk about that on a future show, uh, because I'm, I'm sort of torn on the connection of how he is at the end of Thrawn versus how he is in season three of rebels, but that's neither here nor there for right now. Right mm-hmm. now I'm concerned, not concerned. That's definitely not the word. For now, I'm aware that they are releasing a Thrawn comic, but it's an adaptation of a pre-existing story. And I don't feel like, to me, that's not as exciting. Why don't we have a new Thrawn story? And maybe they're saving something for Rebels, obviously, because he'll be in season four. But it just seems a little bit like, not it's not a cop-out, but I just feel like it was sort of, uh, I think they could have done more instead of adapting something that's already out there in the zeitgeist of Star Wars. Yeah, I could see that. And maybe I'm not as in the loop with some of this stuff, but is there any word of Timothy Zahn maybe doing another one? Does anybody know? I'm not aware, but it no, wouldn't surprise I me. I mean, they adapt the movies into the comics, which already, which, well, sure. but those are adapted, but those are adapted. The novels are adapted from the movie, which is something I, we just talked about a couple of weeks ago, which is just funny. Cause it's like, this is the only, like Star Wars is the only franchise that like does this. It works from like this backwards mm-hmm. way. It makes movies first, and then all the other st- supplementary stuff comes out. Which uh, it, it just blows my mind how it works that way because it's it's one of the few things that can really get away with that, and that's what's amazing about Star Wars. But yeah, yeah. Besides that, Dan, I can't think of anything else. Well, the, the other thing, the other thing that that stands out to me, um, I'm really pumped about. The Legends of Luke Skywalker, as well as Claudia Gray writing Leia, because uh, last time Claudia Gray wrote a Leia novel, I mean, we're talking about Bloodline, of course. To me, that is the best novel uh, of the new canonical focus or vision. Uh, And I think that's she's amazing with Leia and has a great voice with her. And it's a bit of a prequel. uh, I guess, of course, it's a prequel, but it's uh, set before A New Hope. And we're going to learn more about her growing up and how she becomes involved with the Rebellion, which I think will be fascinating. The Legends of Luke will be great because, obviously, there's a ton of unexplored territory with him between, you know, where he is in Return of the Jedi and where he ends up in The Force Awakens. By the way, did you guys see how they have officially said you pronounce that planet? Ashto. No, which one? It's Ashto. No, I hadn't seen it. Yeah. Ashto. Bless you. Yeah. So that's how you pronounce it. (laughs) <laughs> How about that? So that, those are the two things that jump out for me. What, what else do you have for us, Tom? Well, I've got news that I wish had come out about 40 years ago, and that is the Radio, <laughs> Radio Flyer, the famous wagon and tricycle company, announced at San Diego Comic-Con that children can have their very own Luke Skywalker X-34 land speeder. This land speeder seats two and drives forward in reverse and speeds up to five miles an hour. While that might have taken Luke a little longer to find R2 on Tatooine, children are sure to find this a a thrilling ride around the neighborhood. The speeder comes with a dashboard console and has a shifter that puts the speeder into park, forward, or reverse, and has a selection of five buttons that play sounds, including an engine startup and shutdown, speeder flying sounds, and then a few lines from A New Hope, including 3PO, saying there are several creatures approaching from the southeast and luke saying look there's a droid on the scanner dead ahead might be our little r2 unit hit the accelerator oh man. those were that was, those were me doing those not i didn't I, take those i off felt those like i was movie. watching the wondering. film right there that was that yeah, was magical in case you were wondering, yes. And then there's some R2-D2 chirps and whistles. I've posted specs for the land speeder as well as a promotional, a fun promotional video by Radio Flyer on 
Twitter at DraftLine, or you can find it on and other Star Wars related San Diego Comic Con news on the Coffee with Kenobi website. Well, very thank you for the plug, sir. Um, all right, so I think it's fair <laughs> to say that when we saw this, and I haven't spoken to any of you about this, but when we saw this, I mean, raise your hand if you don't think this is the coolest thing ever. I don't see anybody raising their hand. So it is the coolest thing ever. The weight limit is 130 pounds. So you got to keep that in mind, folks. And and I think the price point is $500. Does that sound correct? That is correct. Wow. Uh, I I think my son needs Mm. one of these. What kind of dad would I be if I didn't get him this? (laughs) Right. Right, and I know I know a couple people who would who would love to share the the passenger seat with him too. <laughs> the fact yeah. that it goes that it has all not including sounds, myself. <laughs> I, that's who you were. Let's be honest. We know what you were talking about. What's in your coffee, buddy? <laughs> the two of us <laughs> <laughs> driving down the school hallway. Won't that be a thing? Deanna won't be embarrassed at all. Not at all. All right. So <laughs> I, I did hear today that there is a little bit of. A very, very small amount of backlash because people are saying, because they're doing this with Radio Flyer, that it is eliminating children's imagination. And I definitely do not agree with that at all. What could be more imaginative than picturing yourself on another planet? <laughs> yeah. So do you guys have your eyes on this it, thing? It sounds like I've got to lose a lot of weight to get up. Yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, like, there you go, I goals. Mean, Dan, you've met me in person. I'm a big guy, you know. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to have to... I'll probably have to lose three of myself to get onto this thing. So I'll be, uh, I'll, I'll be a fourth of the podcaster I used to be, I guess. So, <laughs> uh, to get onto this thing. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it looked cool. Like I don't have kids myself. I know, uh, I hate to keep bringing up my co-host Mike, but I got to give him a plug. Uh, his six year old daughter, he, I know, I know he posted it on Facebook and he said, Hey, you know, wifey, we got to get, we got to get this for the daughter, you know? So, I mean, he's definitely looking into it. So I hope she gets it, you know, because he's, uh, always trying to convert her into the, uh, star Wars way. And he is succeeding, uh, very well so far. She loves Ray and all of those characters. So, uh, this would just be another way to keep that Skywalker, uh, in the, in star Wars and stuff going for him. And so I'm, I'm rooting for him to do that. And that'd be awesome. Yeah. I mean, it looks cool. And, and you always think back and you're like, why didn't they have that when I was a kid? And I think that yeah. that's always the sentiment. And you, we said that 10 years ago, we said that probably 20 years ago, even when you're 15 years old, you're like, why didn't they have that when I was five years old? I remember saying that 20 years ago when I was 15. And I said, why didn't they have that when I was uh, five years old? And uh, you know, so they, there's always going to be those kinds of things. And so obviously it's very cool and uh, it, it's just amazing uh, how far they're, they're taking everything nowadays. Just uh, just everything. It's it, it blows my mind. Do we have a release date on this thing? Just fall, I know it's in the fall. I just want to know when the speeder bike comes out. Oh, nice. <laughs> well, here's the thing. That's obviously I Radio Flyer. The adult version. Yeah, the, it goes well, 50. Good luck with that. Be on the highway riding a speeder bike. <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty sure it'll be a Rancho Obi Wan when it comes out. And <laughs> uh, Dan, to yeah. answer your question, September 5th is when the oh. speeders will be available. So just after uh, the second Force Friday, basically. Just in time yeah. for the holidays. That's right. Well, that's you're going to need a pretty big stocking to put this thing in there. <laughs> it's going to need its own garage. Well, you know, just hope you don't have to go pick up some power converters because, you know, you don't want to waste your day doing that mindless nonsense. That's you know, true. So you waste get on time with your friends when your chores loop. are done. Yeah. 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 Can you imagine that? That would be an amazing thing for, you know, the mom or the dad or both of them. They bring the thing home and they say, here's a birthday present. Here's a Christmas present. And they say, no, wait a minute. You got to cut the grass first before you can ride it. Like, that would be amazing. Like, that would be a total uncle uh, Owen move and I would love it because Uncle Owen in my opinion Uncle Owen is one of the biggest jerks in Star Wars I'm not afraid to say it I, I, I you know so there you go so I, I would love that that would be a classic Owen move but well, the Uncle Owen people are going to be parents out there I love the Lars family don't get me wrong but <laughs> but Owen is a jerk I mean let's, I mean he's basically I hope he's I, not I, listening I Dan I have a follow up story from yeah. a few weeks ago in response to a now famous little girl from Evanston, Illinois, Star Wars fans across the United States, and a tweet from 
J.J. Abrams, as of July 25th, Hasbro has finally made the Force Awakens Monopoly game, including the Ray playing token, available in the United States. Fans may purchase the game on the Hasbro website, and Michelle Smith from the Seattle Times reports that the website originally stated only one game may be purchased by that per household, but that notice was removed after the Associated Press inquired about the purchase policy. So now... Ray may be may purchase and sell properties with the rest of them. Well, that is great news, and this is an example of the power of social media to to do something uh, in a healthy, productive way. And right on, that's good. Thank you for that, Tom. We are going Absolutely. to take a break, and when we come back, we will play Mediocre Jedi's Hasbro interview from San Diego Comic Con. This is Coffee with Kenobi. This is Coffee with Kenobi. Oh, pass the cream, would you? Coffee with Kenobi was sponsored by Penguin Random House Audio. Looking to catch up on the latest Star Wars books? Try listening to them on audio. Featuring sound effects and music directly from the movies, Star Wars audiobooks are the definitive listening experience. From brand new audiobooks such as Thrawn and Empire's End Aftermath to our blockbuster movie tie-in editions, you'll have plenty to keep you entertained. Visit PenguinRandomHouseAudio.com slash Star Wars for sample clips and to start listening now. Coffee with Kenobi is also sponsored by the Star Wars digital card trader collecting app from Tops. If you love Star Wars and love the excitement of chasing your favorite Star Wars collectibles, the Star Wars digital card trader collecting app from Tops is for you. Download the free app from iTunes or Google Play and collect your favorite images from the classic 1977 Star Wars cards to the Clone Wars, Star Wars Rebels, the Force Awakens, Rogue One, and much more. Collect and trade with friends new and old through the Star Wars Digital Card Trader Collecting app from Tops. These are the cards you're looking for. Alrighty, I am here at San Diego Comic Con 2017 at the Hasbro Toys booth. I'm here with Joe Ninavaji and Steve Evans. And uh, Joe, for uh, could you tell us what you do at Hasbro? Yeah, sure. I'm the uh, marketing director for Star Wars at Hasbro. And Steve? I am the design director for Star Wars at Hasbro. All right, so we're talking with two guys who definitely know a lot about Star Wars toys here at Hasbro. Um, can you tell us about the Imperial Combat Assault Tank that we saw the other day? Yeah, so we brought Vintage Collection back for 18. We were thrilled to announce that at Celebration, but, you know, it's not just figures. Obviously, that's the focus on it, but there have been some amazing vintage vehicles that we've done, and we wanted to bring it back and do something totally new, and we all fell in love with the, uh, the Assault Tank from Rogue One, and it's, uh, it's just a great uh, vehicle for us to do. Um, and Steve and his team, especially Mark Boudreau, who's a legend in our business, has just put so much love into it. As you saw from that exploded view, there's so many intricate details, down to the space coffee cup, to the kyber crystal uh, cylinder, to the kyber crystal itself. So we're thrilled to have that part of the vintage return in 18. And I think it was one of those, uh, it's one of those vehicles that we wanted to know what was going on underneath the hood. You know, it's, it's carrying the kyber crystals in these cargo boxes, which has a very unique way of opening. So we're kind of intrigued in that and like, well, the people inside, what do they look like? It's a tank. We kind of know what a tank is, but how does it look different? So it was just one of those kind of intriguing ones. And it was a good scale. You know, we promised to make the scales proportionate to, to the fantasy for a vintage collection. There'll be no kind of scaling down. There'll be a little bit of scaling down when you get like big, like even the Yatta, it's not really to scale that we, used to, that we did uh, many years ago. But uh, yeah, it's a good start. So we can confirm then that you say at at and not at at. I do say at at. Yes. Okay. Which works. which which is the proper way, yes. by the way. Um, I hate to ask about uh, the females' outfits, but Padme has had so many looks throughout the uh, the prequels. Is her starfighter pilot disguise in the Forces of Destiny doll indicative of how we'll see her in Forces of Destiny? Is that anything you can comment on? Um, I'm not totally sure, to be honest. I know that they do try to go close to the reference of, uh, of the show, so I'm assuming that that'll be how she appears in the show. Um, I'm not going to say that that's the only outfit. I mean, obviously, she's got such awesome outfits. We talk about her for Black Series. What's going to be the Padme outfit that we do for Black Series? So there's a lot there, but I mean, that will be the first one, and I'm sure that that's going to be tied to an episode, uh, some the reference, but who knows what's to come. So you have been wondering what kind of outfits she'll be wearing in the Black Series. Can you yeah. can you tell us more about that? Well, I mean, I think it's only inevitable that we get Padme into Black Series, and we're certainly been talking about that uh, a lot. We're having that conversation right now. It's like, okay, if we were going to do Padme, what should she, how should she, yeah. how should she appear? 
I'm actually asking you. What do you think? Yeah. What do you, what do you think? Um, I, I do like her action scenes. Um, I, someone had brought up um, the, the, the Geonosis Arena outfit, but then, you know, she's bare midriff that may or may not go over very well with some people who are right. buying those, uh, those toys slash collectibles. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's something y'all could run as a, uh, as a poll. Yeah, I'm I sure. Think I think it's an interesting point. I mean, like, you know, the Queen outfit, I, I'm going to really struggle to do that for 1999. So that's, you know, sort of you, you immediately that's kind of the go-to thought. But she's got a lot of great outfits, and uh, I think that's a cool poll idea. Look at that out there. It, I, I, I can think of plenty of fangirls that are out there that would love to be able to uh, have some input on yeah, that. Right they on. have fanboys as well, okay. but uh, I wouldn't want just just me. You wait. You're asking me, and when I what I say, you'll just immediately start designing, right? Yeah. This yeah. Is, uh, like you've got you've Jedi mind tricked us, so this is this is how it's going to go from now on. So just let us know what you want. I like this. I should do this more often. <laughs> Especially uh, with your Hera head over here, it's just it's got it's just you know intriguing. I got you. For the record, Joe is referring to the fact that I am wearing uh, Twilight uh, Leku today. <laughs> Doesn't match my skin tone, yep. and uh, and it's very warm, <laughs> but it's nice. Uh, can you tell? It, it's actually my natural look. Is it? Yes, oh, yes. Wow. I was considering spiking him up. You're a natural line. I, I am. I am. <laughs> and we'll stop there. Um, when will we see a Hera Forces of Destiny doll? And if we do see one, will it come with Chopper? Um, I don't know for sure. Um, again, everything kind of rides off the entertainment. I'd be shocked if there wasn't a Hera coming down the pike, but uh, you'll have to wait and see. The only thing we're revealing right now at, the, at this con was Padme, so stay tuned. I will do that. <laughs> Very uh, ambiguous answer yeah, there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> How about, um, can you tell the huge fan response to the Hair of the Black series? Yeah. Now, we saw it here last year, mm -hmm. and we see it here again. It's my understanding there were some issues with paint, mm -hmm. and uh, I'd like to know more about that. When will it come out, please? Yeah, so it's coming out uh, It's coming out not much later than it was planned, You know, kind of like next wave or so, so it'll be out in the fall. Um, there was a lot of rumors on the internet about the about the uh, knees that we were kind of re-sculpting that. That's not the issue at all. It was a paint. We had a, actually, funnily, we had a, an issue with the uh, paint, the actual kind of skin tone. It was coming out a bit apple and it just didn't look right. So we went, you know what, no, let's put it back, get it back in, reproduce it, and get uh, get the right skin tone. So yeah, it was a it was a deco, a deco alignment mm -hmm. to get it looking spot on. Super, and of course the fans want to see it look exactly yeah. like they would see on the screen. Exactly. Um, yesterday you revealed that you would be making a Dr. Afra character. Question that came up on the PowerPoint slide. Yeah, that was it's, a mistake. Okay, okay. <laughs> what I'm referring to for those at home is it's the, the card said Legends, and it made us, and a lot of people said, wait a minute, she's a canon character, so if you could comment on that. Yeah, I think um, we probably put... You should let me comment on that. Yeah, okay. They should let me comment. So that was, that was, I actually did the PowerPoint deck, so I, I was... That's not packaging graphics. That's just me putting stuff on PowerPoint. And I was like, how do I name this? And I was under the impression that anyone that I didn't know quite where to fit in, I could use the, the catch-all as legend. So that will not be the, uh, the name that goes on packaging. I will make sure I let my Lucasfilm people tell me what they need to call that. Right. You know, because she. I don't know what to call it, though. I, I still don't know what to call it. Call yeah, it. Like, Comics? Like Darth Vader? Like, it does, you know, like, so what's the, uh, the right. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. So we will. I will ask my contact. Come awesome, because you know she didn't go to six years of evil medical school to be called Mi Ms. Afra, yeah, yeah, right? Ms. <laughs> yeah. Right. She's a doctor, and yeah. you will refer her to her, her as such. Um, a question that I, I, I polled our uh, our listeners: Will the Star Wars uh, Celebration Orlando exclusive 40th anniversary Luke in X-wing ever be sold again? Probably not. No, I mean we that 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 figure itself was from our original. It was the very first Black Series figure we did. Um, but the special edition package that we had done for Celebration, um, you know, we kind of kept that tight for Celebration, and that's probably it. It makes sense. You know, if you're going to go buy yourself an exclusive and wait in line to do that, yeah. you want to make sure it's actually exclusive. Yeah. Uh, a question that came up about the Force FX lightsaber, Ray's saber. Is there any mechanical difference between that and the Luke ESB saber? Yes, there is, and that's all I'll say. <laughs> okay, because of course we don't, we don't canonically, we don't know what happened between uh, when Luke uh, lost an appendage. Yeah, yeah, lots of things, lots of people have had it. I think it's been passed down from generation to generation. Yeah. Who knows who's had their hands on it? So you'll have to check it out for yourself and have yeah. a look. Maybe, maybe there'll be a movie about it yeah. in the in the future. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The lightsaber standalone film. That's good. <laughs> These two gentlemen are dancing a little bit. 
Um, another question from our listeners. Are there any plans to make 3.75-inch figures of the Clone Wars characters who we haven't seen yet, like Satine, uh, Bo-Katan, uh, Bo-Katan uh, Pong, Krell, etc.? Yeah, I think everything's under consideration. The Clone Wars, you know, we've done Rex um, in, in six inch. Uh, nothing's off limits. You know, we, we try and align ourselves to the latest entertainment, which is the right thing to do. And then we kind of throw in classics and uh, whether and TV shows, so it's Clone or Rebels. So never say never, but there are a lot of characters out there. So it's we'll get to some and we won't get to others. For quite a while. That makes sense. Um, I can imagine that uh, designing a toy that has four arms as opposed to, to yeah, two. Yeah, he's tricky. Because yeah. he obviously was part, on the six inch, he was he was uh, up there on uh, some of the, the, the more favorite suggestions. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Pong Krell? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, when we had the last, uh, last no, I apologize, the um, Super Articulated. The Super Articulated three and three quarter inch, he was, he was mentioned quite a few times. But he was like, oh, my God, he's big. That's a big figure. Yeah, to each their own. Okay, well, gentlemen, is there anything else you would like to tell the Coffee with Kenobi listeners about what Hasbro's got upcoming for for uh, for Star Wars? You know, we, we, we can't wait for you guys to experience September 1st, Force Friday 2. We have a lot coming. Um, thank you so much for all your input. and Keep the feedback coming, and uh, may the Force be with you. What he said. <laughs> all right, all right. Thank you both. I really appreciate your time, and may the Force be with you as well. Better than one of those coffee chains. It's Coffee with Kenobi. Before we get to email, I want to thank our CWK sponsors, Penguin Random House Audio and the Star Wars Digital Card Trader Collecting App from Tops. Please support them the way they support our podcast. And remember to listen to new and archived shows of Coffee with Kenobi wherever you listen to podcasts, including iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Player FM, our Coffee with Kenobi website, www.coffeewithkenobi.com, or wherever you enjoy listening to your favorite shows. And if you listen to the show through iTunes, please leave us a review. We are also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Pinterest, Tumblr, and we'd love for you to check us out there. And while you're at it, be sure to listen to our CWK family of shows, including Legends Library, hey, hey, Rebels Reactions, Comics with Kenobi, and Lattes with Leia. From Eric Okenhoot. Hi, Dan. So here are some thoughts I had on D23 news concerning the Star Wars theme park, Galaxy's Edge. It's exciting that we're getting an actual place to visit that makes us feel like we're living in the Star Wars universe. However, I'm even more excited for all the new books that we're getting. I've never been a huge fan of amusement parks, but I've been an avid reader since I was very young. I know I'm weird, but that's okay. Living in the Star Wars universe has never been a great want of mine. I just love reading the stories because that's what Star Wars is, a great story. Thank you, Eric. And guys, what do you think about that? I, I We didn't really talk about that with Jim at the top of the show, but for people who don't want that immersive experience, I think that may be a, a huge uh, detriment or a deterrent for them to wanting to even stay there. Right. I, and Dan, I mean, I, I definitely can feel that because it's some people I think are going to have the idea that this is just oh i can just walk right in and i had no idea until uh, you know listening to the gym and hearing that interview that that's not really going to be the case it's not going to be just like hey i can walk into in and, and go get in line and do this and do that it doesn't sound like that's going to be the case at all uh so i i i, I personally think that that's off-putting for somebody like me who it would be a once in a lifetime uh, thing to go and do and now it's like I, I think that you know that's it, it really makes me think like well now that's something I'm probably never going to get to do, uh, and and that's just me being honest and 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 because it sounds like it's you know going to cost a heck of a lot of money. Um, I don't remember any figures he threw out, so I don't I'm not going to throw any figures out there. But it, just to do that, I, I just feel like it's not like, hey, I can just walk up and... A family of just, four uh, for two nights, and I, I think it's a minimum yeah. two-night stay, you're looking at over $2,000. Okay, well, okay, that's <laughs> not horrible, I guess. Like, that's that's not horrible. Okay, I that's not as bad as I was thinking. Uh, and I'm sorry I missed that earlier. But, you know, I, I just imagine, like, someone, like, if when I was a kid and my dad... Like, my dad would not get wrapped up in all of that stuff. Like, he's going to be like, leave me alone. 
Yeah. Like he's just like I, I he, like I mean some people are just kind of like not into that stuff and they're mm-hmm. like I don't want to be a, like I just want to be with my kids and we're gonna walk around and I don't want to do the whole dog and pony show. Sure. Now, great it it sounds and and I'm not dogging on this man because it sounds amazing and honestly it what it's it sounds exhausting actually. It not does for the, a little bit. It doesn't sound relaxing, but I think we're looking at something that's more of an experience for the employees. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm saying like for the employees, oh, yeah. and they're going through this every day. This is this sounds like an exhausting it's experience for them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then and, and that's going to be and I so I can understand the price, but this is something unique. So I, I give kudos to Disney for trying something so unique in this. So, uh, yeah. I mean, I I just can't. If I had a kid or something, maybe you go and try to do this. But for myself. I, I think the movies for me uh, are in, in all the other content, that's probably enough. And I, you know, because I, I get to be so creative in what I do anyway. And, and, and I can just kind of imagine stuff in my head. I don't know that I necessarily, you know, and you've got cons and stuff where you can have people cosplaying and, you know, you can LARP if you really want to, you know, and that mm-hmm. probably don't cost very much. So I, there are alternatives. I'll just say that, but overall it does sound like, it would be an amazing experience, but it doesn't sound like it's going to be necessarily for everyone. And Luke, but I guess you, you could say that about almost everything in life. Uh, I mean, personally, so the thing for me is if I'm going to spend that much money and I want to see how it is, because if you're spending two thousand dollars, I want the experience personally, but I want it to be my experience, my story. I don't want to be walking around with this group of 10 other people. You know you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. If it's going to be me and my kids. So I'm, I'm interested to hear how they're going to tailor that. So it actually feels like a personal experience to you. It's not like a group thing. Um, I'm sure if anybody can do it, it's going to be Disney. Absolutely. You know, they, and, you know, I think there's going to be cool stuff too. If you don't stay at the hotel, I'm sure they're going to have stuff like – um, you know, Harry Potter land where you have the little wand and you can activate things. I'm sure they're going to do stuff with this. Yes. Um, you can maybe agree. use the force at different things and maybe you, you can lift an X wing or something. There you go. So I'm sure it's going to be cool walking through star Wars land and the little missions. Um, and who knows, maybe there'll be some personal missions you can walk on kind of like how, you know, you look for all the little Mickey heads. Maybe there'll be yeah. some stuff you can search for too. So those Hit of us, that, there you go. Yeah. So, I mean, I think there'll be, a good environment for people that want the experience and then those that want to just walk around get the missions Disney's smart they'll they'll get the best environment for everybody absolutely from Jonathan Cohen I was very happy to learn that John Jackson Miller will be joining the Canto Byte team for the collection of short stories coming out in December I feel that he did an excellent job with Kenobi in A New Dawn and that he's been underappreciated for the past few years I was thrilled to learn that Jason Fry would be heading up the novelization of The Last Jedi and I feel confident that he will do a good job. He has done multiple projects for Star Wars, but has not really received all that much recognition for it. Lastly, I went to a a bookstore at 901, it opened at 9, and bought Inferno Squad and absolutely loved it. I am a third of the way through and believe that Christy Golden knocked Dark Disciple out of the park and has done it again with Inferno Squad. Love listening to you guys dissecting D23, and thank you for reading my email. Well, you are absolutely welcome. I I am also... Uh, knee deep into Inferno Squad. Can't wait to finish that and get in more on the conversation. I know Christy Golden wrote Dark Disciple, as you mentioned. That is my second favorite novel in the new eras. More John Jackson Miller and more Jason Fry. It's it's great, great news. So a huge thank you to Luke Siders and Joe Stinson for having a cup of coffee with me. Where can listeners get in touch with each of you if they want to ask you a question or just say hello? Uh, yeah, you can uh, get us at cantinacastfanmail at gmail.com. And you can find us on Twitter at the Cantina Cast and Instagram at the Cantina Cast. We love Instagram, guys. So uh, just hit us up there and you can find our podcast, the Cantina Cast, on any of your podcatchers. And uh, that's basically it. So for Legends Library, we have Legends Library Podcast on Facebook and then it's Legends Library on Twitter. Um, that's where we have the most action. And then Legends Library at coffeewithkenobi.com if you want to shoot us an email. Um, stay tuned because in the next couple months we're going to be having our Legends Library card again this year where we do a drawing and the winner gets to pick a book they want to review and they come on the show with me and Randy. So stay tuned for that. Which is super cool. 
Thank you to each and every one of you for listening to and supporting Coffee with Kenobi and for contributing to Star Wars Conversation. We will be back next week with two new co-hosts and more Star Wars talk. This is the podcast you're looking for. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. There's no one here. Move along. Move along.